Story eight of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight Marines Signaling Under Fire at Guantanamo. They were four Guantanamo Marines, officially known for the time as signalmen, and it was their duty to lie in the trenches of Camp Macalla that faced the water, and by day signal the Marblehead with a flag and by night signal the Marblehead with lanterns. It was my good fortune, at that time I considered it my bad fortune indeed, to be with them on two of the nights when a wild storm of fighting was peeling about the hill, and of all the actions of the war none were so hard on the nerves, none strained courage so near the panic point, as those swift nights in Camp Macalla. With a thousand rifles rattling, with the field guns booming in your ears, with the diabolic Colt automatic clacking, with the roar of the Marblehead coming from the bay, and last with Mauser bullets sneering always in the air a few inches over one's head, and with this enduring from dusk to dawn, it is extremely doubtful if any one who was there will be able to forget it easily. The noise, the impenetrable darkness, the knowledge from the sound of the bullets that the enemy was on three sides of the camp, the infrequent bloody stumbling and death of some man with whom perhaps one had messed two hours previous, the weariness of the body and the more terrible weariness of the mind at the endlessness of the thing, made it wonderful that at least some of the men did not come out of it with their nerves hopelessly in shreds. But as this interesting ceremony proceeded in the darkness, it was necessary for the signal squad to coolly take and send messages. Captain McCullough always participated in the defense of the camp by raking the woods on two of its sides with the guns of the Marblehead. Moreover, he was the senior officer present, and he wanted to know what was happening. All night long the crews of the ships in the bay would stare sleeplessly into the blackness toward the roaring hill. The signal squad had an old cracker box placed on top of the trench. When not signaling, they hid the lantern in this box, but as soon as an order to send a message was received, it became necessary for one of the men to stand up and expose the lights. And then, oh my eye, how the gorillas hidden in the gulf of night would turn loose at those yellow gleams. Signaling in this way is done by letting one lantern remain stationary, on top of the cracker box in this case, and moving the other over to the left and right, and so on in the regular gestures of the wigwagging code. It is a very simple system of night communication, but one can see that it presents rare possibilities when used in front of an enemy who, a few hundred yards away, is overjoyed at sighting so definite a mark. How in the name of wonders those four men at Camp Macalla were not riddled from head to foot and sent home more as repositories of Spanish ammunition than as marines is beyond all comprehension. To make a confession, when one of these men stood up to wave his lantern, I, lying in the trench, invariably rolled a little to the right or left in order that when he was shot he would not fall on me. But the squad came off scathless, despite the best efforts of the most formidable corps in the Spanish army, the Escudera de Guantanamo. That it was the most formidable corps in the Spanish army of occupation has been told me by many Spanish officers, and also by General Menacal and other insurgent officers. General Menacal was Garcia's chief of staff when the latter was operating busily in Santiago province. The regiment was composed solely of practicals, or guides, who knew every shrub and tree on the ground over which they moved. Whenever the adjutant, Lieutenant Draper, came plunging along through the darkness with an order, such as, Ask the Marblehead to please shell the woods to the left, my heart would come into my mouth, for I knew then that one of my pals was going to stand up behind the lanterns and have all Spain shoot at him. The answer was always upon the instant, Yes, sir! Then the bullets began to snap, snap, snap at his head, while all the woods began to crackle like burning straw. 
I could lie near and watch the face of the signalman, illumined as it was by the yellow shine of lantern light, and the absence of excitement, fright, or any emotion at all on his countenance, was something to astonish all theories out of one's mind. The face was in every instance merely that of a man intent upon his business, the business of wigwagging into the gulf of night where a light on the marble head was seen to move slowly. These times on the hill resembled in some ways those terrible scenes on the stage, scenes of intense gloom, blinding lightning, with a cloaked devil or assassin or other appropriate character muttering deeply amid the awful roll of the thunder-drums. It was theatric beyond words. One felt like a leaf in this booming chaos, this prolonged tragedy of the night. Amid it all one could see from time to time the yellow light on the face of a preoccupied signalman. Possibly no man who was there ever before understood the true eloquence of the breaking of the day. We would lie staring into the east, fairly ravenous for the dawn. Utterly worn to rags, with our nerves standing on end like so many bristles, we lay and watched the east, the unspeakably obdurate and slow east. It was a wonder that the eyes of some of us did not turn to glass balls from the fixity of our gaze. Then there would come into the sky a patch of faint blue light. It was like a piece of moonshine. Some would say it was the beginning of daybreak others would declare it was nothing of the kind. Men would get very disgusted with each other in these low-toned arguments held in the trenches. For my part, this development in the eastern sky destroyed many of my ideas and theories concerning the dawning of the day, but then I had never before had occasion to give it such solemn attention. This patch widened and whitened in about the speed of a man's accomplishment if he should be in the way of painting Madison Square Garden with a camel's hair brush. The guerrillas always set out to whoop it up about this time, because they knew the occasion was approaching when it would be expedient for them to elope. I, at least, always grew furious with this wretched sunrise. I thought I could have walked around the world in the time required for the old thing to get up above the horizon. One midnight, when an important message was to be sent to the Marblehead, Colonel Huntington came himself to the signal place with Adjutant Draper and Captain Macaulay, the quartermaster. When the man stood up to signal, the colonel stood beside him. At sight of the lights, the Spaniards performed as usual. They drove enough bullets into that immediate vicinity to kill all the Marines in the Corps. Lieutenant Draper was agitated for his chief. "'Colonel, won't you step down, sir?' "'Why, I guess not,' said the grey old veteran in his slow, sad, always gentle way. "'I am in no more danger than the man.' "'But, sir,' began the adjutant, "'oh, it's all right, Draper.' So the colonel and the private stood side to side and took the heavy fire without either moving a muscle. Day was always obliged to come at last, punctuated by a final exchange of scattering shots, and the light shone on the marines, the dumb guns, the flag. Grimy yellow face looked into grimy yellow face, and grinned with weary satisfaction. Coffee! Usually it was impossible for many of the men to sleep at once, it always took me, for instance, some hours to get my nerves combed down. But then it was great joy to lie in the trench with the four signalmen, and understand thoroughly that that night was fully over at last, and that, although the future might have in store other bad nights, that one could never escape from the prison-house which we call the past. At the wild little fight at Cusco there were some splendid exhibitions of wigwagging under fire. Action began when an advanced detachment of marines under Lieutenant Lucas with the Cuban guides had reached the summit of a ridge overlooking a small valley where there was a house, a well, and a thicket of some kind of shrub with great broad oily leaves. This thicket, which was perhaps an acre in extent, contained the guerrillas. The valley was open to the sea. 
The distance from the top of the ridge to the thicket was barely two hundred yards. The dolphin had sailed up the coast in line with the marine advance, ready with her guns to assist in any action. Captain Elliott, who commanded the two hundred marines in this fight, suddenly called out for a signalman. He wanted a man to tell the dolphin to open fire on the house and the thicket. It was a blazing, bitter-hot day on top of the ridge, with its shriveled chaparral and its straight, tall cactus plants. The sky was bare and blue and hurt like brass. In two minutes the prostrate marines were red and sweating like so many hull-buried stokers in the tropics. Captain Elliot called out, "'Where's a signalman? Who's a signalman here?' A red-headed Mick, I think his name was Clancy, at any rate it will do to call him Clancy, twisted his head from where he lay on his stomach pumping his lee, and, saluting, said that he was a signalman. There was no regulation flag with the expedition, so Clancy was obliged to tie his blue polka-dot neckerchief on the end of his rifle. It did not make a very good flag. At first Clancy moved a ways down the safe side of the ridge, and wigwagged there very busily. But what with the flag being so poor for the purpose, and the background of the ridge being so dark, those on the dolphin did not see it. So Clancy had to return to the top of the ridge and outline himself and his flag against the sky. The usual thing happened. As soon as the Spaniards caught sight of this silhouette, they let go like mad at it. To make things more comfortable for Clancy, the situation demanded that he face the sea and turn his back to the Spanish bullets. This was a hard game, mark you, to stand with a small of your back to volley firing. Clancy thought so. Everybody thought so. We all cleared out of his neighborhood. If he wanted sole possession of any particular spot on that hill, he could have it, for all we would interfere with him. It cannot be denied that Clancy was in a hurry. I watched him. He was so occupied with the bullets that snarled close to his ears that he was obliged to repeat the letters of his message softly to himself. It seemed an intolerable time before the dolphin answered the little signal. Meanwhile we gazed at him, marveling every second that he had not yet pitched headlong. He swore at times. Finally the dolphin replied to his frantic gesticulation, and he delivered his message. As his part of the transaction was quite finished, whoop! He dropped like a brick into the firing line and began to shoot began to get hunky with all those people who had been plugging at him. The blue polka-dot neckerchief still fluttered from the barrel of his rifle. I am quite certain that he let it remain there until the end of the fight. The shells of the dolphin began to plow up the thicket, kicking the bushes, stones, and soil into the air, as if somebody was blasting there. Meanwhile this force of two hundred marines and fifty Cubans, and the force of probably six companies of Spanish guerrillas, were making such an awful din that the distant Camp Macalla was all alive with excitement. Colonel Huntington sent out strong parties to critical points on the road to facilitate, if necessary, a safe retreat, and also sent forty men under Lieutenant McGill to come up on the left flank of the two companies in action under Captain Elliott. Lieutenant McGill and his men had crowned a hill which covered entirely the flank of the fighting companies, but when the dolphin opened fire it happened that McGill was in the line of the shots. It became necessary to stop the dolphin at once. Captain Elliot was not near Clancy at this time, and he called hurriedly for another signalman. Sergeant Quick arose and announced that he was a signalman. He produced from somewhere a blue polka-dot neckerchief as large as a quilt. He tied it on a long crooked stick. Then he went to the top of the ridge, and turning his back to the Spanish fire, began to signal to the dolphin. Again we gave a man sole possession of a particular part of the ridge. We didn't want it. He could have it and welcome. If the young sergeant had had the smallpox, the cholera, and the yellow fever, we could not have slid out with more celerity. As men have often said, it seemed as if there was in this war a god of battles who held his mighty hand before the Americans. 
as I looked at Sergeant Quick wigwagging there against the sky, I would not have given a tin tobacco tag for his life. Escape for him seemed impossible. It seemed absurd to hope that he would not be hit. I only hoped that he would be hit just a little in the arm, the shoulder, or the leg. I watched his face, and it was as grave and serene as that of a man writing in his own library. He was the very embodiment of tranquillity in occupation. He stood there amid the animal-like babble of the Cubans, the crack of rifles, and the whistling snarl of the bullets, and wigwagged whatever he had to wigwag without heeding anything but his business. There was not a single trace of nervousness or haste. To say the least, a fight at close range is absorbing as a spectacle. No man wants to take his eyes from it until that time comes when he makes up his mind to run away. To deliberately stand up and turn your back to a battle is in itself hard work. To deliberately stand up and turn your back to a battle and hear immediate evidences of the boundless enthusiasm with which a large company of the enemy shoot at you from an adjacent thicket is, to my mind at least, a very great feat. One need not dwell upon the detail of keeping the mind carefully upon a slow spelling of an important code message. I saw Quick betray only one sign of emotion. As he swung his clumsy flag to and fro, an end of it once caught in a cactus pillar, and he looked sharply over his shoulder to see what had it. He gave the flag an impatient jerk. He looked annoyed. End of section 12